The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Glory Glory to you, you, O Lord. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your parents. He replied, I have kept all these since my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, There is still one thing lacking. Sell all that you own and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the reign of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the reign of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? He replied, What is impossible for mortals is possible for God. Then Peter said, Look, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or spouse, or siblings, or parents, or children for the sake of the reign of God, who will not get back very much more in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Today marks my 11th time preaching at opening convocation, and let me assure you that a decade of experience at this makes it none the easier. While translating, then studying, slowly composing, right up to this moment, the room is very crowded. You see, you are all present. You and others just like you, faces and voices, inspecting my words, raising your concerns, clamoring for attention that I cannot satisfy. I mean, I'm glad for the company, really, but the expectations are pretty steep, especially today on the cusp, not just of a fresh semester, but a year that promises major changes for our school I can sense all the aspirations and grievances and doubts and losses, the potent feelings that bloom at a time like this. So, the pressure I feel right now, as faulty as it is entirely self-imposed, is to speak a decisive word. Remain totally relevant and cool. Meet your expectations, and with just the right mixture of challenge and cleverness and perfectly calibrated comment. Instead, instead today, today we only get Jesus back on that tiresome topic of God's reign, served up by Luke with a side dish of warnings about the rich. 
And while the rich are always in season, what becomes far less appealing is that this whole scene is focused by one simple-minded Sunday school question about how to inherit eternal life. Eternal life? I mean, what could be further from our minds today? Eternal life was sure, maybe a big deal to your grandmother, but is that why you came here? Or returned this year? Or have worked so long within these walls? Good grief, we have better agendas, don't we? More nuanced views, real commitments, so that eternal life seems like an antique artifact of a bygone era. So, spoiler alert, this reading will disappoint those with more important things to do. Not because it's so remote, but because it is so basic. Luke aims to reset our basic expectations, to rearrange what we regard as important, to reorient us toward lasting life. Does that matter? Does that matter to you? When we meet Jesus today, he is nearing the end of a very long journey that lasts 11 chapters in the heart of Luke. Along the way, we have heard healings and parables, speeches and sayings, arguments, and struggles about his authority to speak and act as he does. Along the way, though, there has also not been a great deal of clarity. Confusion and conflict and cluelessness, yes, but not much clarity. And along the way, there has been this growing sense that something big was coming, not so much about Jesus as through him, as if the bewildering mass of words and events so far were just about to snap into focus. And that's what happens in today's story. Someone called a ruler. It's a neutral term here, a local leader. Someone called a ruler steps forward with a basic question that you may think about very little, the question of eternal life. We won't test you to see when the last time you pondered this was. This incident matter lasts only a moment in Luke. But in this very moment, in this simple encounter, the storm briefly lifts. The eye of the hurricane passes over, and there is clarity. Clarity begins with that ruler. As Matthew or Mark tell this story, the ruler interrupts the journey, stops everybody, but not in Luke. He seems to be already on the road. Part of the entourage? Didn't see that coming. We've heard his very question posed earlier within Luke, but there it was as a test, a challenge. Here the question is welcomed, answered by reciting the commandments. When the ruler says he's followed these since youth, Jesus doesn't disagree, but calls him to a deeper faithfulness of letting go. And when the ruler reacts to this word, he doesn't just become sad, as the NRSV blandly says, but as other lexica say, he was afflicted beyond measure, deeply sorrowful, grips by a painful fact. And then, strangest of all, and unlike the other Gospels, the grieving ruler does not depart. Only in Luke, he hangs around, stays, waits for more. More clarity? 
still looking right at the ruler who has never left the scene. Jesus says more for all who will listen using that weird image of camels and needles. It's about the only thing people recall about this story, which ironically shows its effectiveness. It's not meant to confuse us or be a joke or mock the rich. It's meant to hone a sharp contrast. Using the largest and the smallest things his hearers would daily encounter, Jesus clarifies the difficulty of entering God's reign. There's a misalignment between camels and needles. There's a misalignment between the rich and God's reign. And the contrast Jesus draws becomes a little bit too effective at making its point because suddenly the crowd grasps a whole broader meaning. This is about everybody. So they don't ask Jesus, well, hey, can any of the rich be saved? They want to know if anyone at all can be saved. They and that ruler now share a sorrowful plight. So let's review. A ruler, only later known to be rich, is not prejudged as evil, but affirmed as faithful. His question leads him deeper than he wants to the precipice of sorrow and grief because he recognizes how possessed he is. The larger crowd, of which he was evidently a part and continues to be a part, hears the clear word from Jesus that God's reign is fundamentally incompatible for such as him. And they, in turn, draw the far wider conclusion that this isn't simply about wealth anymore. It's about all that possesses you, riches and otherwise. To which Jesus offers a confirmatory response. Yes. Yes, it's just as hard as that. It's beyond you to enter eternal life or God's reign or be saved, which are all the same in this text. It's beyond you. It's not beyond God. In this one little scene, Luke makes this all crystal clear. Ah, but now, now comes Peter, surely an opportunity for bumbling confusion. And yet again, this story surprises us. Peter says, rightly, that they left what was theirs. It doesn't say left their houses or homes. That's the NRSV. It's a different phrase. They left what was theirs and followed. And rather than rebuke Peter, Jesus affirms him. Yes, you left all for God's reign. Yes, treasure is yours both now and in the age to come. Yes, you grasp finally what this is all about. A moment of brilliant clarity has dawned in Luke's gospel only to slam shut four verses later in the very next story when Jesus reminds them of his approaching death. Despite what they could see so clearly today, Jesus, Luke says then about Jesus dying that they understood nothing. For what he said was hidden from them and they did not grasp what he said. But as for today's story, just for now, right here, one thing is clear. Renouncing what is ours and gaining eternal life are fused together. Releasing what we have and entering God's reign are two sides of the same coin. And note that Jesus does not make dispossession a precondition, something to do in advance. After all, he's the one who said that entering God's reign was impossible for mortals. So how could we ever do it on our own? 
beforehand. Instead, releasing us from what binds us is God's merciful work, a holy gift received as we follow God's way and daily enter God's reign. Letting go of what holds us fast is the start to inheriting eternal life, is the entry to God's reign, is being saved today. God's reign is not a destination way out there for some day. It is the road we travel now. Though we can't see it all fully yet, we can glimpse a new creation that God is making, making through us. I know at this start of this year, a thousand other priorities seem more important. Check my calendar. We are so bent on securing our own lives, being in control, tending our reputation, holding tightly to these and the many other currencies in which we daily trade, but that in fact possess and own us. So much of our lives is chaotic and disordered, vying to dominate us in a struggle to hold on to our place and keep others in theirs. But today, today Luke introduces us to a ruler whose simple and basic question promises to upset and rearrange all that strife with a new orientation, away from what tries to keep us in its grip and toward God's merciful embrace. It is meant to disrupt our world, reset our values, free us for others, grant us new family and fill us with lasting life. As this fresh year begins, I would venture, friends, there's nothing more important, nothing more basic for us to consider.